morning again. The resurrected king is resurrecting me. Um, not in my sermon notes today, but I was at a Catholic mass um, on Friday. My son Andrew, who was on keys, uh, goes to a Catholic high school, and it's kind of part of uh, just kind of part of what they do. My wife works there, and um, anyway, I don't go to those kind of things. But they went on a retreat, and um, at the end, you know, they invite parents to come. It was interesting. There was a lot of getting up and getting down, getting up and getting, who was raised Catholic. You know what I'm talking about, right? They, uh, they do a lot of that, and that was raised Catholic. Um, but it was made very poignant. I don't know if poignant is the right word. Powerful to me in this. Uh, while the children were on their retreat, uh, there was a storm last week, and a woman who lives in Beaver Creek was down in Cincinnati, and uh, random, if anything is ever random, a tree fell in her car, and uh, she was... Uh, basically brain dead, 80%, and then she died just a little bit before the mass started. She has two children at that school. So uh, she's in her 30s. And I don't know why, but it's just like, you know, tears just started to stream down my face as I realized this freshman and this senior uh, in this school where, you know, some people do love Jesus, but a lot of it's just getting up and getting down, doing the religion thing. And, uh, you know, I don't know anything about the family. I know my, my, my daughter, Mike, is good friends with the, with the freshman. She's a freshman there, too. But just, it just, I, I can't really even put words to it. It's just like if Jesus isn't everything, we got big problems. You know, we just do. And, um, and I really want to talk about that today. You know, you know Jesus came um, preaching and teaching in that three-year window when he was, you know, doing his public ministry. And the crowd started to follow him. And as the crowd started to follow him, um, you know, it got, it got a little crazy at times because, uh, you know, people just follow for the dumbest reasons. You know, we just follow crazy people. I was reading some, I can't even tell you, it's so ridiculous. I was reading about this pastor this morning out in Colorado somewhere. I was in, in Christianity Today about this pastor who basically just denies everything that Jesus says and preaches a whole different gospel. And People are following her. And it's this silliness because it's over and over and over that we do that. But anyway, Jesus just cut to the core of who we are. If you ever read the scriptures, when you get into the stuff, you know, in the Old Testament, maybe it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. You know, it takes a lot of learning. Basically, you've got to understand the New Testament before that makes a lot of sense. But when you get to the part where Jesus' words are in red, if you read those and they don't cut you open, there's a problem in there somewhere. It just is. And so he was speaking these words, and he was moving people to think a new way, to not think about religion, but to think about relationship with God through Christ. And he said things like this, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life, and unless you come through me, there's no way to get to the Father. It doesn't matter how much religion you have doesn't matter how many times you get up and you get down or how much you kneel or how much you even read your Bible or how much you pray. If it isn't in Christ, if it isn't in the blood of Christ, it means nothing. Actually, it does mean something. It means that, you know, you're damned and you don't know it. So I don't know why God gives me this voice. I just, I've always just had this sense that, you know, that it's desperate that we have to reach souls for Christ because you breathe your breaths and when they're done, you're finished. And you face your maker. And I feel like the worst possible way that you know, the world could be or that the church could be is not hot or cold, but lukewarm. Lukewarm. He's like, I'm gonna, you make me throw up. Revelation, he says, you make me throw up. This is not good. You're not hot or cold. Maybe I could reach you if you were hot. I could use you if you're cold. Maybe I could, you know, startle you with your sins. But you're just somewhere in the middle, you know, standing up and sitting down. And Anyway, um, I, I talked a little bit a few weeks ago about do not worry. Jesus says, do not worry. Can you add a day to your life? No, you can't. I take care of the birds in the field. I take care of all of that stuff. Don't you know I'm going to take care of you, and yet you clamor around worrying about what you're going to eat and what you're going to drink. Believe me, on your deathbed, you won't be worrying about that. You'll be wearing a stupid robe like Steve was wearing the other day at the hospital. <laughs> you know? If you're lucky. Or maybe you're just in your car. 
and you never see it coming. Don't worry. There's nothing you can do about it. And then I said, don't judge people. And we do that a lot. And then I did the sermon about Jesus versus mammon or Jesus versus money. And then uh, last week I said, remember the poor. It's just one of the, you know, just the themes that run throughout God's teaching to remember the poor. And the greatest people like Job, you know, it just says that they just cared for the poor. They loaned to the poor. They gave to the poor. And even if you're poor, you can still take care of people like the woman with the two mites who just gave to God. She gave everything. This week, you know, I, I know I'm going through and finding startling things, as if not thinking that money is more important than God would be startling, but it startles a lot of people. So I got another one for you this week, but this one's kind of shocking, and um, a lot of people will just be like, what? <laughs> what Jesus is basically saying is, I have to be better, bigger, larger, greater than every other thing in your life. I have to be greater than every other thing in your life. And then he kind of gets into some serious details that are like, what? Um, Jesus came, and a lot of times I think we get this picture that Jesus just came, and he just wants to bring us peace. He just wants to bring us peace. And he does because he said he wants to give us peace, yes? But we have kind of a Jesus that's been taken to Bob Barker and spayed or neutered, you know? (laughs) Jesus... (laughs) was the same Jesus who's flipping over tables with a whip that he wove and who's saying things to people like, you're whitewashed tombs, you look great, but inside you're just rotting inside and everything about you is ridiculous. And he just he looked at people and he told them the truth. And my general theme about the way I kind of preach and the way I counsel and the way I teach is this, looking the way Jesus did it. If you were religious and self-absorbed and not humble, he went right at it, baby. He just took you down. But if you were broken, and there was some humility in there somewhere, then he was like the woman at the well. You've had five husbands, and everything about your life has been a disaster, and you know it. Drink this water, and you'll never be thirsty again. And so hopefully, whenever I talk, you'll see both sides of that, going right at people, but at the same time offering Truth that, you know, can save your soul. So anyway, here's the thing. In Christ, we are no longer under the Father's wrath. Do we have peace in that? Yes. You know, we're no longer under God who created everything's wrath. We're under grace, under his Son. And so this wrath has been poured out on his Son so that we can have grace. And so now we have the free gift of salvation. Amen? Right, and then we can grow and we can learn and we can serve the church and one another. And, and our forgiveness, you know, makes us perfect in God's eyes. Don't let that escape you. The forgiveness that, that we get from the cross of Christ and the blood of Christ makes us perfect in God's eyes. And I am far from perfect. How about you guys? But when he sees us, he sees his son. And so do we have peace in that? Yes, here it is. John 14, 27. Jesus says this. I am leaving you with the gift, peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give is a gift that the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. The world cannot give you the peace that knows no understanding. And all those who are in Christ know it. You know that sense when you realize that shockwave that went through infinity that your soul saved, that your sins are forgiven. And even though you continue to do them, you know, he's still got grace. Now, this comment that Jesus makes is kind of going to blow us away because I just said that he brings peace, yes? And so this statement is kind of startling. About three years before he says this John 14 thing about this, my peace I give you, he said these words. If you would read with me Matthew 10. I'm going to read uh, 32 through 39. Jesus said, Whoever acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But, don't miss this, whoever disowns me before others will be disowned by my Father in heaven. Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the world or to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. Now, is he arguing with himself? No, he's not, and I'll explain it in a minute. For I have come to turn, and he's quoting Micah, uh, I think it's uh, Micah 6.8 here. He says this, a man, I come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. 
Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. That's what the song is saying, right? It's saying that, you know, we find our real life in Christ. Father, I just pray that your spirit would move us, Lord. Teach us. Send your spirit here in spite of us, Lord, in spite of our sins. Teach us, Lord, because you see us as righteous in your Son, and we need it. Expose in us, Lord, the, the parts of our heart that need you more. May we be more about you, God. May you be everything, and may we fade away. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Listen, Luke, um, if you're not familiar with the, with the scriptures, here's what's going on here. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the Gospels, right? And without getting into huge detail, Matthew, Mark, and Luke all saw Jesus. They were there. But, but Luke, Luke was kind of on the periphery. And so Luke is a physician. He's a doctor. And I, I, I like John's gospel probably the most. I like Matthew's maybe the second. But Luke's, Luke's is really powerful in a crazy way. He, as a physician and, a, and a, like an engineer kind of a mind, he put everything in chronological order. So he sees these, you know, disciples out there, and the way they write sometimes, like, what, did that happen first, or that happened second, and, you know, because people see car wrecks in a different way, right, you know, oh, this, I saw this, but Luke just takes all of the Gospels together, and the Lord allows him to put them in chronological sequence. Um, so you'll see just little bits of different words, and in, in, uh, sometimes when one person tells a story, and another person tells a story, just like I said, if we, if we see an event, you know, you'll remember different things, but Luke uh, takes a, a, even a more, I would say, startling approach to this uh, Jesus saying, you know, you got to love me more. And here, here it is in Luke 14, uh, 25 through 34. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus. And turning to them, he said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, and yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. So again and again he says it. There's, there's, this, there's this thing in you that has to be a love for me that's beyond all of that. Now, the reason why I brought the Luke one out is because he includes the wife. And the other one doesn't include the wife or the spouse, if you will. This one he's saying, even your own other half. If they, if they are more important to you than me then you don't get it, and you can't learn anything from me. That's what it means when it says, be my disciple. It means learn from me, follow me, learn and do what I do. Now, as Jesus was preaching, you know, the crowds began to swell. And just like in a church, there's people there for all kinds of things, right? Some are there to see their friends. Some are there to update, you know, each other on live. Some are there to talk about the baseball game, the football game, or whatever. And some people are there for God knows what reasons, show off their clothes, but there are a few that are there to hear and learn from the Lord and to worship the Lord, right? And so whenever you get a crowd, that's what you got. And I think what Jesus does is he speaks to the crowd and says, listen, I know a lot of you have motivations that are not about this. Pay attention. This is a big deal. And he says startling things because he's trying to startle people. He's trying to serve a lot of people's needs, but he's also cutting right in half things that people think and, and dividing them up. Remember that Jesus always tried to make a smaller crowd. Did he? Yeah, he did. When he gets a bunch of them together, one time he says, if you don't eat my flesh and drink my blood, you can't follow me. A whole bunch of them left. <laughs> they all became Catholic. <laughs> he said it and they left. Other times he said other startling things, and I think right here probably a lot of people, can you imagine the wife and the husband? What? I can't, you got to love him whether you love me? That's craziness. But he says it. Remember, it's a crowd that was gathered around who screamed, crucify him, crucify him. Is there any fear of crowds, you know, in God? No, God doesn't fear anything, but I get the point. Crowds often get together and say things they shouldn't say, like, hey, let's build a golden calf and go back to Egypt. Group think you know, is a serious problem. And I think a lot of times in the church today, we have groupthink that leads us to lukewarm. I don't want to swim counterculture anymore. All right? You don't want to swim counterculture anymore. But you want to be called a Christian. That's a non sequitur. 
I'm not even sure what a non sequitur is, but it sounds right. It doesn't make any sense. They don't go together. So what happens is this. Um, Jesus always gives the, like, worst part up front. I learned that in business school. I got a business degree, believe it or not. You just tell people the worst possible thing up front. One time my wife was, uh, she saw me interviewing a babysitter or something, and I said, you know, if this or this or this happens, you know, we will let you go. She's like, why do you always try to scare them off? I was like, that's actually good management. <laughs> tell them the truth. Jesus did that kind of stuff, and that's what he's doing. See, Satan doesn't do that. He does it the opposite. Satan always tells you the good part and hides the truth. Right? Hides what's inevitable when you do it. But th that's not how God works, okay? So let me ask you this. Uh, would you rather please God or yourself? Would you rather please God, the creator of all things, heaven and earth, the creator of you, the one who says don't worry, the one who says I'm better than money, the one who says don't you know, look to other people for your attention and affections. Would you rather please him or would you rather please yourself? And the answer to that question really is everything. That's the question between feeding the, the spirit of God in you or feeding the flesh. So let me ask you this. Would you rather please God or other people? Because that's the problem with the pulpit today. People want to draw a crowd. Because if I get a crowd, well, then I can get some more money. And if I get some more money, I can build a bigger building. And then, amen, then I'm say, oh, well, that Pastor Jimmy got a big church. Here's what people will always say. So where's your church? Oh, it's over in West Carlton. Oh, really? How many people you got? See, that's the next question. And it's an earthly question. In fact, David, King David, got in trouble for taking a census because he wanted to know how many people he had following him, right? And he got in trouble. God didn't like that. Even though he loved David, he didn't appreciate that kind of thing. And this is, this is what happens. We do that. Now, several weeks ago, I told you that Jesus started this sermon by saying, don't look for approval from others. That was the first thing he said. And then he starts getting into all the other stuff about don't love money, you don't, don't worry, don't worry about earthly treasures, that stuff isn't going to work. So now he takes it even further. He's like, don't even trust in people. Even the closest people to you, even your spouse, even your relative, if, in comparison, it hurts your relationship with me. He doesn't say, hate your father and your mother. That's not what he's saying. He's saying if it's in comparison to me, and you, then you need to understand it's like the East is from the West. You have to say, no, I will not follow this. I will not listen to that. I will follow Christ. Period. And if you don't like it, then I guess we can't go together anymore. That was my quiet time this morning. Amos 1, I believe it is. Can two walk together if they're not in one accord? So I'm not talking about divorcing. I'm not talking about that stuff. I'm just saying about making him number one. Keeping him number one. It's the greatest commandment. The first commandment. Right? Remember the Lord your God. Have no other gods before me. Number two, don't, you know, don't have any idols and all that kind of stuff. I mean, that's what we're supposed to think about over and over. It's like, to me, Jesus teaches the same thing over and over and over, just like I do with my kids. Flush the toilet, turn off the light, right? I think my kids are like, I left the light on for 10 seconds. My dad thinks you're spending all my money. <laughs> well, it kind of feels like that, you know? You teach the same thing over and over. I feel like Jesus does the same thing. God does the same thing over and over and over. You make money, you're God. Don't make money, you're God. You make possessions, you're God. Don't make possessions, you're God. You make other people into idols. Don't make other people into idols. You care about all kinds of things except my Sabbath. You don't care about my Sabbath because, you know, you just got all these other things to do. We care more about what other people think and about what our possessions need than we think about what God thinks or knows or wants. Write that down. Because I believe it is the state of man. I, I believe it is. And so now Jesus is just calling them out. Here's the crowd in front of me. He's just calling them out. If you don't acknowledge me here on earth before other people, when it doesn't even matter, I won't acknowledge you on the day of judgment. If you're more concerned with what other people think about you and the stuff you're about and what the world's about, if you care about that more, you need to understand that the love of God is not in you. 
He is seriously trying to shake people. Listen, if you're about all that, what other people think, you can't be about what I think because they're in comparison completely divergent. Now, that doesn't mean you can't have tight brothers and sisters and people in the church who are all about God and, you know, but you have to acknowledge him. And so write this down. He won't acknowledge you before the Father on the day when it really matters. Not today, which is just, you know, earth. On the last day, when we're all facing that judgment, he says this, Matthew 7, 23, the first part of the verse. But I will reply, I never knew you. I preached a whole series on it. I think it was last year. It's on the, on the app and on the jamescovey.com and on the church website. It's the fact that we have to be, the word no is much more than just no. It's an intimacy like I knew you in the biblical sense, right? It's like Adam and Eve lay together and they knew one another. It's not sexual. It's far more intimate than that. It's the connecting of two souls. And he's saying that never happened. So you didn't acknowledge me, and I can't acknowledge you because, you know, I really like Jesus saying over and over and over and over again, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you this much. Do you understand this is the question of heaven and hell? Do you understand this is a question of eternal raging fire and heaven? I know we don't like to preach that these days, but that's what he's trying to say. He's saying that the Father's Justice requires payment. It's mandatory. And hell wasn't created for you, so don't go there. It was created for Satan and all the demons have fallen. They're going to be captured and put in there and held in there for eternity. Don't go with them. It's not for you. I love you. And so here's the thing. The Father's you know, judgment, the Father's justice requires payment. But Jesus also says, but... Our love, me and the Father, the Spirit, our love requires me to pay for it. So, so take that and, and know this too, but the free will that I gave you requires that you accept it. The free will requires that you reach out and you grab it and say, no, not me, you. I need you. I can't make it on my own. I can't make it five seconds. I can't go, I'm a pastor. I can't make it five seconds without thinking something that's not God. You know, it's contrary to what he thinks because we're humans, we're flesh. So acknowledge him. Why? Well, it doesn't mean you have to run around and go, Jesus, 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 24-7. It means the way you live. And then when somebody says, why do you do that? Say, well, I have a different drummer. <laughs> would you like to hear about it? No, I don't hear about it. Okay, fine. But I will tell you about it anytime you want to know because I believe Jesus is the Son of God and he died for my sins. And I know we don't like that person. Why? Because we're lukewarm. <laughs> believe if you're on fire, you won't care. If you're on cold, it might, you know, be refreshing. But that's not, that's not how we often are. And so Jesus moves on and he said, listen, this, this is a sword. This is a sword. Whoever grew up in church did sword drills. Anybody? It's like, yeah, Elizabeth. I used to be her Sunday school teacher. I don't know if we did any sword drills, but um, this is a sword. Jesus said it's a sword. In fact, Ephesians 6, Paul says it this way. Put on the salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Where did my slide flipper go? There you go. It says it in the Bible. Um, when a sword cuts, something falls on each side. When a knife cuts, something falls on each side, right? It may not be perfectly in half. In fact, when this sword cuts, the scripture says that only a few wind up on the side of salvation and the number of the sands of the sea wind up on the side going to hell. That shouldn't give us any comfort. That should fire us up to try to reach those souls. Some will believe and be saved. And some will just, they won't, to their own peril. I was talking with somebody the other day about the, the, you know, the scriptures, and they said, I am just too, I'm just too smart to believe that. I'm just too science, you know. I'm like, you're just too science. Everything about science screams, there's God who made me. Everything about it, I've got huge books. I mean, when I was a, you know, kind of fledgling Christian or trying to, like, learn, the first things I read, how do we get the Bible? 
How did it get here? Why do we call it the Bible? Why do we think it's God's word? The next thing I started reading, evolution. <laughs> well, I learned evolution in school, right? How can, how can there be some argument there? And I read these books, and I'm like blown away that the truth and the purity is out there. It's just that the science community is like, no, nope, no, nope, not going to believe it. Why? Because then you'd have to get off the throne. You'd have to acknowledge that you're a sinner. Jesus goes on, Matthew 10, 32 to 39. Well, that's 60, 34 to 36. Um, Do not suppose that I've come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Frankly, I know it's not supposed to be funny, but I think a daughter-in-law against a mother-in-law is pretty common. And a man's enemies will be the members of his own household. And so he's saying, I bring in a sword, not, you know, not like big fluffy love everybody. Although in the end, he does say, I give you my peace, right? But here he's saying, I'm not coming to bring peace in this situation. In this, I'm bringing a sword, and it's going to cut. And some are going to fall on this side, and some are going to fall on that side. And what's the difference? Who decides what's on this side and that side? Well, ultimately, your heart. I'm not trying to take God off the throne because, you know, I do believe in Calvinism in the sense that God knows from the beginning of time to the end of time. But somehow, some way, deep inside my heart, with the spirit in there hopefully testifying this, I know that at some point I said, okay, you're going to have to take over God (laughs) and and step away and let him be in charge. And so that's kind of what happens. And so um, Hebrews 4.12. Hebrews 4.12 uh, says it this way. For the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword. Cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow, it exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. That's what happens when you read the red words. Right? Something inside you says, that's you. That's you. It's not just some random people thousands of years ago. It's you. And you have the same attitudes about things, and and they're wrong. Come to me and let me change your heart. Come to me. Ultimately, yes, save our souls, but I'm talking about change my heart now and use me now. Now, we can go on and on and on about I'm too science, you know, whatever. John, I don't have time to get into today. The sermon will be forever. Just read John 3. Just open your Bible and read John 3. You'll read through John 3, 16. You'll read John 3, 17. When you get to the end, it says this. The reason that they don't come into the light is because their deeds are evil. Period. They did not want to be seen for who they are. Who's got sin? Who wants it out exposed in front of everybody? Right. We don't. Right? And so you're going to have to admit that you're a sinner before God Almighty. That's what has to happen. John, you know, is powerful, but certainly John 3 just nails it. Cockroaches like the dark. And that's what's going on in our hearts. And so it exposes us for who we really are. Matthew 10 um, goes deeper, verse 37. Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. And again, Luke, saying it this way, Luke 14, 25. If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, just even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. The world will look at that and say, you're insane, Jesus. My kid is number one. First of all, we only got one or two now, right? Well, I got ten, so, you know, it's easy, it's easy to kind of see it's a little bit different. But now, today, we lift up our kids, number one. Whatever our child wants, that's what's going to happen. We make them gods. And then what happens? Are they better people? Oh, God forbid. No, they're not better people. Just like God wouldn't do that to us. If he said, oh, you just do whatever you want, would you be a better person? No, that's not the way it works. You have to see that that's not the way it is. And so he's saying, hate your family, even your wife, your husband? No. But do you think that made the crowd smaller? Yeah. It did make the crowd smaller because a lot of them are like, no, I can't do that. Listen, we are called to love each other deeply. We are called to die for one another. Yes, and that includes family, right? 
But write this down. If we love them more than Christ, we're unworthy of Him. That's what he's saying. You can't learn because you have a whole nother focus that's contrary to my focus. Have I said this enough times? It falls on both sides. You can't do it. We, we cannot allow ourselves to be drawn away from devotion to Christ by other people's love or by love for other people. Listen, those are great things. They're wonderful things, but they're the second commandment, right? It's first love God, then love other people. In fact, the love for other people comes from God. And so if you don't put him first, you won't actually love other people. You will only love you. It's like trying to take the water from the river and put it back up into the front of the river. No, it's, it's already gone. You have to have the first part first. By the way, who is analogous of a river in the Bible? God. God is the river, right? And, you know, he has to be first. That's the way it has to be. So, moving on. This calling is not a joke. Jesus is saying, you cannot learn from me without making me your Lord. Okay? Even you Christians, even you people who have been believed and baptized, you still can't learn if you don't make me your Lord. I'm not trying to get into growth groups promotion right now, but hey, since I'm here, you can't really learn anything until you say, I'm going to take the time to get involved and learn. Jesus uh, goes on, I didn't have time to get into these verses today, but the famous verses where he says, can anyone build a house without first counting the cost? If somebody's going to go to war, does he first say, hey, how many cannons do I have, and how many people, and how many chariots, and just look and find out how many other people have, and don't go to war if you can't win. If you can't win, then take some people and send some gifts and say, hey, let's be friends. That's what's happening here. You have to say, no, I can't win this war. Hey, God, how about taking that gift on the cross and, you know, putting that on me because I need it. And there is when you start to find peace and love and satisfaction in the world. But, but, but up front, Jesus is saying, it's going to cost you. Up front, it's going to cost you. What's it going to cost you? Everything. In fact, it's going to cost you friends. It's going to cost you attention from other people who you think are pretty cool, but they're not going to think you're cool anymore once you just admit, I love Jesus, okay? It's going to cost you maybe in your marriage. He just says it. It's going to cost you brothers and sisters, moms and dads. It's going to cost you. I had a dear friend. Larry is his name. I'll leave his last name off in case he ever watches Dear friend, I mean, when I was young, maybe 22, 23, I mean, we were tight, real tight. And then, you know, about 28, 29, you know, I started feeling the call and wound up going to church. I was baptized. Jill was baptized with me. And then I felt a call to become a pastor. And, you know, it took a while, but in, you know, some odd years, that call was, was clear. Well, right in the middle of that, you know, I was in the Air Force, so they ship you here and they ship you there, and me and Larry kind of lost ways. But when I worked at Wright Patterson, I was working for the three star in ASD, if anybody knows what that is. And I got a call. And they're like, oh, it's this sergeant, somebody. We were, had both been sergeants back in the day. Now I was an officer, but, you know, we're still just, I couldn't believe he's on the phone. Wow, you tracked me down. He's like, yeah, working top secret world. I can track down anybody. I'm like, cool. He's like, how's it going? And I'm like, oh, it's awesome, man. I'm at Wright Pat now. I'm captain. He's like, oh, you're captain. Yeah. He's like, how's the family? I said, the family's good. I had a couple more kids. He's like, okay, so what else is going on? I said, well, I don't know. I'm kind of involved in our church. He's like, what the? And I was like, well, you know, I became a Christian. And he's like, well, you know, and the conversation lasted maybe 30 more seconds. And I've never talked to him again. That's where it cuts. I lost a great friend. I mean, the stories we could tell, right? But all those stories are now the ones that you look back and you say, oh, Lord, I'm kind of sorry about all that. <laughs> Maybe that wasn't so great. It's going to cost you. Um, you know, I don't talk about this a lot, but Satan is a liar. Satan is a liar. Like I said, he dangles, you know, the sweet part up front. God admits that it's sweet. But the last part, the end part, 
you know, is bad. And that's the same thing happens in this world. It dangles all the great stuff and says, follow me, follow the money, follow the possessions, follow what people think about you. In the end, it leads to hell. See, Satan doesn't care about your soul. He, he's lying to you to get it, but he doesn't care about your soul. He doesn't care about any of that. He doesn't care about you. He only cares about him. And why does he care about him? Because he hates God. Because he's damned. Why? Because he sinned. Because he wanted to take the throne from God. I can prove it to you in the scriptures. He doesn't care about you at all, so why follow him? And all these other people who you're trying to impress, they don't care about you either. They still only care about themselves. It's the truth of it. Nobody cares about anybody else unless they care about God first. Remember I said a couple weeks ago? Unless a man loves Jesus, he only loves himself. Ladies, you're often a pawn in that game. You just don't know it. Um, unlike Satan, Jesus shows him the sticker price up front. You know, I think that the father did that to the son, too. I think he said, son, I love the world so much that I'm going to send you to pay. And the whole time he was on earth, he put apart that part of him, you know, that's glory, and he was just a human. But he knew the whole time that he was going to pay. And, and sprinkled throughout all of the letters in red, you'll see once you know that the cross, you look back and you're like, oh, he was saying he was going to die. Oh, he was saying he, oh, he was saying he was going to give his life. Oh, he was saying he was going to pay for it. Yeah, that's what he was saying. And now he's saying, you have to do it too. You have to die to self in order to see what I've created you for. Matthew 10, the last verse there, the last couple of verses, whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Everybody knew what he was saying because there was crosses all over the place and people hanging on him. So to pick up your cross and to carry it, they knew what that meant. That meant die in a horrible way. Whoever finds their life will lose it and whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. I think we're all often living lives that only Satan could design. Until we lose that money, possessions, friends, stuff of the earth, you'll never see the truth. And God will force you, if he loves you, to see the truth the best way he can. He just will bring all kinds of crazy into your life saying, no, 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 no. I love you, but you can't do it this way. Salvation is well worth anything that we might lose for it. Do you believe that's true? Then why are we chasing all the stuff after we say we have salvation? Um, guys, you can come on up. I'm going to argue with just about, uh, you know, maybe 90% of the churches, not a scientific number. There will be suffering in this life even after you give your life to Christ or he takes it or whatever it is that happens. There will be suffering. There will be difficult times. Jesus said, you're going to have to pick up a cross. He said, deny yourself, pick up a cross, and follow me. That's the truth of the gospel. It may make a small church, but it's the truth. And, and then he says, and I will show you how to do it, because he picked up the cross and he carried it. And he carried it humbly. He carried it sacrificially. He carried it diligently. He carried it obediently. And everyone saw him do it. And he's now losing his life so we can find it in him. So don't be fooled by the transitory nature of this world. Um, like I said, the stuff, the money, even the religion, even the piety, even the other people is what Jesus is saying. Because all that you see is a lie on this earth unless the truth of God is in it and through it. And Jesus says, let me cut your heart open with my word and show you what's in there. And then he says, give me your soul. Give it to me because it's not safe anywhere else. I'm the only one who can hold it and keep it forever. And then give you a peace that far under, out under, overwhelms anything that we can see in this earth. And listen, I want you to, I want you to, I'm closing with this on purpose. It might have been a better sermon if I put it up front, but I'm closing with this on purpose because I want you to leave with this thought as we worship. If Jesus is worth anything, he is worth everything. Father, forgive us. Yes. 
Father, forgive us. We are so short-minded. We see, you know, the things around us with our eyes and hear them with our ears and we're tantalized. The darkness inside us consumes, you know, parts of us. Though our eyes should have light, they often don't. Father, forgive us that we follow stupid stuff transitory garbage. Lord, I pray that that we, your church, would be about you. Father, help us to be about you. Father, if there's anyone here who does not know you, that has never believed, I pray that you would just overwhelm them with your love that they would know the truth and the truth would set them free. And I pray, Lord, if there's anyone here who has been set free but has now been retrapped, that you, that you show them and help them. I pray in Jesus' name.